Hi everyone, it's George here from Any Old Music. Uh, today I thought I'd try a little different presentation format for um, an analysis video. A uh, bit more short form, a bit more impromptu uh, in presentation, which is why obviously you're seeing this piece of paper right here. Um, the main thing is that I would like to obviously uh, look at more music, and the only way I can really do that is relieve the bottleneck on my video production which is the animation and things like that obviously hope to continue doing some of the animation stuff it's just I'd like to do more analyses and share them with you obviously so today I thought we'd take a look at a piece that captured my eye because it was recently uploaded by CMAG7 as a score video and I believe this as it appears here is a score edited by them which they produced for the video and it is obviously as you've just seen there uh, Sen De La uh, for Re or Forest Scenes as it translates into English according to Google Translate which is my reliable uh, means of navigating my uh, painful Englishness as a monolinguist um, the movement we'll look at as well is the Nocturne, which is the first movement. Oh, I'm in the knee, which is probably not right. <laughs> but anyway, it can stay in. Um, and it was by Melanie Bonny, who's a French composer. The turn, well I say the turn of the 20th century. Uh, at this point, it was 1928 when this piece was um, published and she was 70 years of age. Um, and she was a very prolific writer, but that gives you an idea of the time at which she was writing. So yeah, the turn of the century, a lot of things happening early in the 20th century, at the end of the 19th century, particularly in France, uh, with things like Debussy, Ravel, uh, Boulanger, uh, writers like that. And she actually shared um, classes with uh, Debussy uh, while she was at uh, the Paris Conservatoire. So this piece is for as well, an interesting combination. Flute, horn and piano. Well, I say it's an interesting combination. It's, it's, it's a combination. <laughs> um, so yes, today I thought we'd take a look at several things. Um, we'll probably start looking at the form because it's something that I like looking at. It's fairly straightforward ternary form, although there are some interesting uh, smaller level mechanics with the melodies and things like that. Um, I also want to look at the economy of her writing and the, how she uses material and has these ostinati that run through the piece um, that, you know, allow her to maintain interest but, you know, not use too many notes, to quote the, uh, <laughs> to quote the emperor from uh, uh, Amadeus. Uh, the last thing I would like to look at then is the harmony. Um, which is rooted around these ostinatos. She also pivots around the notes of these simple ostinati and has root juxtapositions of a tritone uh, and sort of modal colorings to draw out the qualities of these sort of juxtaposed chords. Um, so if a chord changes underneath, the melody often brings out that change or sometimes adds an additional color um, to what's happening underneath. So, as I've said, the piece is a ternary form, which essentially means follows an A, B, A form. Apologies for my penmanship, by the way. Um, and I will possibly try and get a thicker pen if I, for, if I do this again. Largely speaking, the ABA structure is built around the tonalities. There's a change of key in the middle. Uh, we open an E flat major. And the middle is between sort of D flat and uh, B, uh, D flat major and B flat minor, as well as some sort of modal colorings, as I've said. Um, so that largely gives the ABA structure, but as well, there are repetitions of the themes in the outer A sections. So if we take a quick look at the theme, if you can see on here, hopefully, we have this idea here that starts in the flute.
and we move on to a, an additional part of the theme which almost acts as like a, a consequence, a response to this antecedent idea. Um, then Bonnie, if I'm pronouncing that right, sorry, is she does a, another theme here before not purely replicating the antecedent, but here she starts again before having a similar set of figures. So it rises here, similarly to that. And then it has these semi-quaver figures that are pretty much the same. There's uh, some sort of variation at the end, um, as you can see. It's written out kind of accelerando into the trill, but that is very much the same. So we have almost like an A, A, but the second A is uh, shorter, uh, only playing the antecedent. And then we get the B section in the middle here with the flute predominantly playing the melody again. Um, and then it returns with the theme here, as you can see, very briefly. So almost, you could I guess almost, as I say this, argue that it's a kind of binary form with um, a codetta at the end that uses the A section. Um, I like the idea of thinking it's a ternary form. Obviously it's got a evocative name with the term nocturne and Chopin often use ternary formats for his his nocturnes. That being said, um, this piece is very different to a Chopin nocturne. Um, the melody is less bel canto, more idiomatic of flute, the flute part, uh, player, the instrument. Uh, and the chromaticism is quite different in this piece, as I've already alluded to in the introduction, where in Chopin, uh, which is obviously uh, early romantic, um, the chromaticism in that sort of pulls against the functional tonal harmony as though it's like uh, the tonal harmony itself is an anchor and the chromatic melodic lines are like pulling against it. Um, in this piece the chromaticism is often used almost functionally in a sense to uh, elucidate or embellish the underlying harmony. So the flute will, as, a, uh, as we might actually look at when we look at harmony, it will often play notes of the underlying harmony or possibly uh, a coloured note um, in terms of a note that's in a slightly different mode and has a shade um, of something different to the underlying harmony. My metaphors and descriptive language is failing me today, unfortunately, but hopefully you get the idea of what I mean by that. In, no, in Chopin, the uh, melody, uh, melodic content pulls, whereas uh, perhaps you could say it pushes in this, it pushes the harmony onto us. Following on from that, Bonnie uses, or Melanie, Bonnie uses um, a great deal of repetition. And you can see this immediately from just looking at the score. As you can see here, this itself is a repetition. Um, this figure here of semiquavers, which it's then repeated, and it carries on, and you have these kind of sequential figurations, the same rhythmic structure, the cell. I'm using all the language because I can't think of the right one on the spot, but hopefully you're following along. Obviously different chords, but the rhythmic shape is the same. And likewise, uh, another ostinato. So we, we would probably call this an ostinato here because it often sort of counterpoints or, or works with the rocking, um, the rocking uh, muted horn solo, solo uh, part that rocks backwards and forwards between, well, what would be E flat and D flat at concert pitch. Um, and she uses that ostinato almost throughout, I think there's only one bar where, bar the, bar the beginning here, and in the middle section there's only one bar where this rocking backwards and forwards between E flat and D flat doesn't occur. And the chords often pivot around that ostinato. So, um, as we'll go on to in a bit, there's an E flat and A chord, 
um, or E flat and A augmented chord, which obviously E flat would be the root here, and it falls down to a D flat, which would be C sharp in an A augmented, and likewise later on, um, is it here? Yes, uh, here there's a G major chord or G major seven without the fifth that uh, alternates with a C sharp minor chord. So we're oh, getting pivots around the um, D. Well, actually, no, the E flat here would make that an E flat augmented, but she's pivoting around the note to get to C sharp minor. So, yes, <laughs> that's that. So we've established that there's ostinati in this piece um, and often the 16th note, as I've said, um, follows in sort of a counterpoint, so it's often in kind of 6th or 3rd relation or it might go to an octave, but it's often carefully constructed to reach those sort of perfect intervals in contrary motion and things like that, which I found interesting. Uh, so there's aspects of counterpoint between those ostinati. As I've alluded to as well, we have this A, um, E flat and A oscillation. I've actually got a written part here that I use for my analysis, uh, which might be easier to see, which I've labelled some of the chords E flat and A. So throughout this piece, there's sort of um, L aspects of tritone movement, if that makes sense, which she draws out via the bass. So if we look back at this, we have the E flat major chord going to an A augmented, and we have E flat to A, which is a tritone movement. Um, if I label them, E flat to A, you, you, we get that rocking backwards and forwards as well in the harmony, and that repeats several times. A change that I highlighted here where we have the E flat augmented, that could also, in uh, one respect, be uh, seen as G plus, because obviously they're um, sort of chords of limited transposition, if you like. Um, a G augmented chord is exactly the same as E flat. And then we have a C sharp minor chord here, which again is a diminished fifth. So there's clearly a, an effort to have those relationships between, at least on a fundamental level, on a root level, of a tritone. On top of that, there are also some modal colorings, often in the uh, flute part, whereby she'll use a like Lydian 11, so in bar 9, I believe it was. Where are we? Yes, so we have a repetition here of that A plus chord. We get a D sharp here. Um, let me see. I suppose we've got an F sharp there, which could change the sonority to um, F sharp minor. Um, I'm trying to see where the notes are. I think before that was... So yeah, we've got this oscillation. It's Often, I suppose, a chord's structure is changed by subtle movements of a semitone here and there, and depending on what's in the uh, in the piano part and what the melody's doing against it. So, arguably here, I called it a sharp eleven because I was thinking still that this was an A chord. Um, whether you'd agree with that, not so sure. But either way, that's what I'm trying to say is that she kind of pivots against these chords. So. As we've, we've got the A and there's the Lydian quality above it. There is also another juxtaposition, um, trying to think where that is, bar 11, where we have again this E flat plus in the in the bass here, or in the harmony rather. Remember we've got the E flat up here still in the in the horn which obviously written B flat but sounds E flat and up here we have uh, the outline of B major so there's these juxtapositions of uh, scales um, scale structures and harmonies so that was a very impromptu look at the nocturne um, wasn't trying to be uh, comprehensive 
uh, just wanted to test out this format and try and get some feedback from you. I was, as I say, it was only the other day that I was captivated by this piece, um, which CMAG7 uploaded and thought, oh, I want to have a look at that at least a little more closely and share that look at the piece with you guys. Um, it has sort of like a very filmic quality to the harmony. Um, obviously at this time, might not have been thought about in that way, but in uh, retrospectively now to to me when I heard it, it it gave a filmic quality and as I say it produced imagery inside my head of the forest scene itself at night time which is very rare for me to have that kind of response to a piece of music so as I say that was what caught my attention and I think in that sense it could be a very interesting piece for film composers as well as concert composers to look at um, because as well, I mean, it's interesting that she evokes that with just a flute, horn and piano as well. Just sheer economy all over the place. Um, it's a very splendid piece and I'd recommend going to listen to it. Thanks for watching everyone. Please like and subscribe if you want to see more of my composition analyses in your YouTube feed. I've also recently started giving composition lessons online. If you'd like to find out more, I've placed a link in the description below. See you again soon.